going to speak to us about emergency medicine. She is a graduate. She graduated from uh, med school in 1990. Mm -hmm. Her father worked at German Shepherd Border Patrol, yep. which is right up my alley because by profession I was a customs broker for the Homeland Security. She has German Shepherd dogs. She shows her performance and she currently works in Montana. She does general practice as well as emergency medicine. And I hope she's all going to give us some tips on how we might be able to save our dogs' lives. So please, welcome. Thank you very much. So everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, okay, good. So I'm coming at this from a little bit different angle than you probably were expecting or have seen before. Um, I've worked in Montana in three different emergency practices. Um, in all of them where we live, there's one doctor and however many technicians, sometimes there's one technician overnight. Sometimes there is five and six, six, te sex. six technicians overnight. Um, I was looking at you, Val. What was that about? <laughs> um, so it, it's more smaller than a lot of you may have in the larger cities where there's multiple practices. So anything that I say as far as tips about coming in and what to do before you get there or when you call comes from a small practice type of a situation. So um, first we're going to talk a little bit about what we would like you to do in the very beginning as you're making the phone call, as you're coming in, as you're arriving at vet hospital. All of these things are going to increase the probability that you're going to be seen quickly. We're going to be able to give you the right information over the phone if we can give any information over the phone. And when you get there, we'll be as ready for you as we can, as quickly as we can. So I'm coming from this more of a, please don't do this. And we'll go through some slides that say that. And then at the end, we'll get through some specific scenarios of things. Okay, this is one of the things you want to do in this, in this situation. Um, if we have time at the end, if you have a specific scenario you'd like to know a little bit more about or what you should do ahead of time, certainly let me know and we'll go through that. So it's do this, don't do that, please. Um, so first thing you would, we would like for you to do is know what's normal for your dog. What is their normal temperature? The only way you're going to know that is if you're taking their temperature on a once a week basis, know what their temperature, heart rate, um, hydration, gum color, range of motion, which is moving their legs. Move their legs when they don't hurt. Then you know what their reactions are going to be if you're trying to find a spot that they hurt. Go down their back when they don't hurt so that you know if their back hurts, oh, that reaction is a normal reaction on a normal day. Now this is different from that. So knowing what's normal for your dog, both in what we call vital signs, which is temperature, pulse, respiration, and then um, the hydration status, checking the gums. That's the best way you can do that at home. They should be nice and moist. But all dogs are different. Some dogs are droolers, some are not. So knowing what's normal for your dog is going to help you when you get on the phone We say, okay, assess their gums. Is it different than you normally see? Is their hydration good? So practice things when your dog is happy and healthy. When they're laying there sleeping, get your hands under their abdomen, press a little bit. Run your hands back and forth. What sort of a reaction do they give you when they're normal? Then when they are painful, you will say, oh my goodness, I know there's abdominal pain here. This is, and, and then you can let the, whoever's on the phone let you know there's abdominal pain. And then we can get ready for you uh, in a more quick manner. Is it really an emergency? In my idea is if, you think it's an emergency if your dog is in pain, if you can't see someone until Monday, if you're going on vacation and the pet sitter is coming tomorrow and you want to take care of a problem, that's an emergency. You can come in and pay me to see your dog. We'll take care of you as soon as we can. You may be behind the person who has a bleeding dog or a bloat or something like that, but true emergencies, the ones that really need to be seen right away, things like seizures, anything to do with an eye. A squint can be the beginning of glaucoma. 
It can be the beginning of an ulcer that's just going to get worse with one paw swipe or rub along the carpet. Any eye issue, I would not ever wait any longer than a few hours. And if you have to, put a cone on them to protect the eye from further damage. So all eye issues should be seen right away. Um, any protracted vomiting and diarrhea. The first time your dog has vomiting or diarrhea, you probably don't need to go right in. If it's protracted, meaning once an hour, once every three hours, once every day, twice every day, as long as they are acting normally otherwise, probably can wait. We'd be glad to see you, but that probably can wait. So the protracted is the important word there. Um, any sort of swelling or edema. Um, swelling comes more from joints. Edema is under the skin. Edema are the things you see like in a venomous bite, a spider or a bee sting or something like that. Um, those things in my mind always need to be seen. 90% of those things are, especially if it's a venomous bite, are probably going to be okay with time. But what if you're the one in 10 or your dog is the one in 10 that's going to progress and you didn't come in when we could have stopped it quickly with some injections? Many people like to just give Benadryl at home. That works 90% of the time. What if your dog is the 10%? So I would prefer to see them because I know I can stop it and I can, I can watch them and make sure it doesn't progress. A couple of hours in the hospital, if it's not progressing, you're good to go. Those things that progress, progress quickly and catastrophically. So we'd like to see them for any sort of a, a swelling like that. Um, anytime you suspect a poisoning, that of course is um, an emergency. Most phone calls for poisonings usually aren't. There's something else, but if you think it is, we want to see them right away uh, because it's important that we get on the uh, proper treatment for that as soon as possible before any sort of toxins or poisons are um, go, go into the body and they're absorbed. Um, envenomation, snakes, spider, insects, scorpions, those things that sting and have fangs, those we want to see right away. Um, I'm from Montana and we see during snake bite season, I must see five or six a weekend rattlesnake bites, um, especially during hunting season on both ends. Those field dogs are out there. I see a lot of field dogs come in with snake bites. So we'll talk a little bit about treatment later if we get there. Um, thermal stress, heat or cold, those we need to see right away, not because you're not fully capable of warming them up or cooling them off. It's what's happening inside the body while that is happening and how quickly that happens. Actually doing it too quickly is more detrimental to them than cooling or warming slowly. So you don't want to do things too quickly that puts them into hypovolemic shock. So you want to those are things we want to see. You, there's some things you can do before you get there, but we do want to see that's bleeding. We're not talking about the little, the, you know, tiny little scratch or something, but any bleeding that you can't control, we want to see them for. Um, changes in breathing patterns. Again, this is, the important word there is changes. So you need to know what's normal for your dog before you know what's changed. Um, you want to know the rate. You want to know how deeply they breathe, both at exercise and at rest. Um, and when they're just walking around the house. Breathing pattern changes can be anything from panting for a prolonged period of time to actually having to use their abdomen to make the diaphragm work instead of the diaphragm working by itself to move the air in and out of the lungs. Um, so you wanna know if there are changes from what is normal for your dog. So knowing normal again is very important. Any sort of straining to eliminate, it's more important urine wise than poop wise. Many times um, people will come in and think their dog is constipated when actually they've had diarrhea and are straining because there's irritation back there instead of actual constipation. It happens, it's not the most common thing we see, especially in dogs, um, but straining to urinate is a life-threatening emergency. If it's a urinary tract infection and they're actually getting the urine out, it's not. But if they're blocked for some reason, it is. What happens is the, the urine stays in the bladder, builds up toxins, and they've actually poisoned themselves. 
Uh, that happens most likely with stones, but can with prostate problems, prostatitis, trauma, um, tumors, those sorts of things. So any straining to eliminate, if you're not absolutely sure which one it is, if it might be urine, you should get in and be seen so we can take a look. Again, one of the things you can do to try and figure that out is feel their belly. If it's tense, they've probably got a big old bladder in there. It's probably bladder and not something else. Um, any sort of extreme pain. Again, this is going to be very dog dependent whether you think they're very painful or not. The little chihuahua is going to react very differently to back pain than is our German Shepherd dogs. The little chihuahua is going to scream when I look at him and say, can I see your back? And they're going to freak out. And the German Shepherd is going to say, uh, please don't touch that. Or just say, OK, you can touch it, but just be quick. Be quick and be done. Um, so again, knowing normal. If it's very painful, we probably need to see them. We want to help them take care of the pain and make sure it's not something that's likely to progress. When you call the clinic first, um, listen carefully to the questions that hopefully the technician is on the phone asking you and answer questions truthfully. You would not believe the number of times where people, you're embarrassed, they got into something they shouldn't have, they, you know, I left the garbage out and they got into the garbage. People don't want to admit that because we don't care. We want to know the truth. We want to really know what's going on with your dog and what might be the problem. So we won't yell at you. We won't be judgmental. But tell the truth. Give good, honest answers. Um, the technicians that are talking to you over the phone are, for the most part, very well trained at triage over the phone. So please be nice to them. Um, many times the um, Everyone's in a panic and they're like, I need to talk to the doctor. I need to talk to the doctor. That's only going to delay things. And that's the next thing up there, especially in a one doctor practice. I may be in surgery doing something. I may be having three patients. I may be looking at blood work. By the time I'm going to have time to come to the phone and talk to you, you could have been there texting you. We get you in line and we get you in. So please believe the technicians. They're highly trained, highly skilled people and they will be able to take more time with you and try and help you than I would be able to, and I can't always get there, um, or a veterinarian can't always get to the phone. So insisting on speaking with the vet is more likely to delay your treatment and being able to get some answers than speaking with the technician and having them help you sort things out. They're very, very good. Um, it is illegal anywhere in the United States and mostly dangerous for you to be giving any sort of medical advice over the phone not having seen your pet. And the reason for that is, is people's descriptions of what's going on is very misleading sometimes. Some people will describe a wheeze as not a wheeze or my gosh they're vomiting and they're actually regurgitating. So it's um, important that we don't give the wrong information because the wrong information can be detrimental. We'd rather give no information than the wrong information. And it's illegal for us to give any sort of medical advice over the phone without seeing your pet first. So we have to be very careful about that. Um, so be kind and know that we want to help you, but we can't tell you. Can't tell you what's wrong. We can't tell you what to do about it because what if it's wrong? and something happens because we gave you the wrong advice. We don't want that to happen. We want to be right. When you come in, bring all the medications and supplements that you're giving. They may or may not have any drug interactions with what we want to give. So either bring it or bring a list if you can. If you don't want to bring them all, line them up on the counter and take a picture of them on your phone and bring them in. The age of cell phones helps in our diagnosis and being able to treat your pet a lot. Um, and I don't think I put it on a slide, but I'll just say it now. If your pet is doing something weird, coughing, sneezing, gagging, seizuring, having weird tremors, get it on video and bring it in when you come. It helps us to see things and actually that it is much better than a description of something that's happening intermittently. We can actually see what's going on, see which muscles are being used, see their body posture, see whether the cough is coming from up here or down here. 
we can tell that from seeing their behavior. So if you can catch anything on video, catch it on video. Um, oh, I did put it on there. Look at me. I'm well, smarter than I thought. So <laughs> if they're doing something weird, if something's coming out of their body that you don't think should bring it in, we want to see it. <laughs> we want to see vomit. We want to see poop. We want to see pee. Um, if you think they're having a problem eliminating, if you think it's a urinary tract infection and they're just peeing a lot, please try and bring some in. It's very, very stressful on our pets to try and get a urine sample or a stool sample in the hospital. None of the ways I have are kind. They're not kind at all. We use a catheter, we use a needle, we make them go out on a short leaf, we're chasing them with a little pee cup. That is very stressful. So anything you can do to keep the stress level at a low, level for your pet is better for them. <coughs> um, excuse me. Be patient. Um, most people in my hospital, most of our clients are seen or at least triaged within an hour. <coughs> if we think it's um, a, a true emergency, bleeding, problems breathing, we see you right away. Um, don't give any medications before you come in without consulting your veterinarian or your clinic. <coughs> Again, there are things that you might give that are going to be difficult for us to either give another medication or take an x-ray. Pepto-Bismol is one of my worst enemies. There's salicylic acid in it. They've changed the formula, at least the liquid part. Um, it is an aspirin type product. It increases, oh, thank you. It, increase, it can increase bleeding times. We are um, cautioned by the, by the drug companies with other non-steroidals, things like carprofen, um, which is Rimadyl, and Deramax, and Medicam, and all of those, with giving with any sort of aspirin product. There's supposed to be at least a seven to 10 day washout period between giving those on top of each other. If you give Pepto-Bismol, I'm gonna have to give you three different medications to protect their stomach if I'm gonna give a non-anti-steroidal. So, and then the bismuth in, anti, in, in Pepto-Bismol will show up on the x-rays if there's enough of it. So we're not gonna be able to tell whether that's the Pepto-Bismol or a foreign body, and it could be something, it could mask something that we wanna see on the x-ray. Pepto-Bismol is not, it really doesn't do anything anyway. Please don't give Pepto-Bismol. Um, so don't give anything before you come. Some people, I just gave them an aspirin. Oh, great, but now I can't give this, or if I do give this, I'm gonna have to give all these other medications to protect them, and I know I'm not supposed to be giving this other medication on top of the aspirin, but I have to, because they need something, and aspirin's not gonna do it. Aspirin is 35 times more likely to cause any ulcers than is Rimadyl or Deramax or something. And the latest studies show that one tiny dose of aspirin is causing micro ulcers in the stomach 100% of the time. So I don't like aspirin either. Can you tell? Um, transporting. If they're painful enough to try and bite you or bite us when we come out to the car to come and get them on a stretch, please put a muzzle on them. <coughs> If they tolerate it well, if it's more stressful for them, we can always put one on when we get there. But we don't want you bit. Uh, many times that will complicate things too, because I'll see you come in with a bleeding arm and say, okay, give me your dog, you're going to the hospital. I have to tell you to go to the hospital. And then I don't have you there to answer questions and you're not there with your pet. So, and we want everybody to be safe. Muzzles, you can take leashes. Um, I can show you with my dog up here how to make a quick leash or a quick muzzle with a leash that'll stay on. Uh, you can use rags, you can use nylons, you can um, use anything that's sort of strappy and we can show you, I can show you how to do a quick muzzle that'll stay on that it's safe. Um, don't lift them by the abdomen. If you have any, if you have an older dog, number one, and if you have any indication that there's an abdominal problem. If you've got a big splenic tumor in there that's bleeding and you lift them into the truck by the abdomen, that could cause a huge flood. So be very careful in lifting them in and out, scooping behind the, the behind and on the chest, 
put them on a board, put them on a stretcher. Even if you just get a big blanket and two people put them on the blanket, everyone takes a corner, up you go, in. Don't pick them up by the abdomen. Um, if there's something bleeding in there, you can make that a lot worse. Or if there's a bladder that's very large, you can actually rupture the bladder if it's large enough and has been large enough for long enough time. So don't, try, don't lift them by an abdomen. Use a board if you have to, um, a door, a plywood, anything like that. If they're very painful, that will reduce the movement. Their legs won't be dangling, their head won't be dangling. If they will stay on the board and you can lift them up and put them in, that's helpful too. Um, and cover them with a blanket. I don't mean their head, but their body, a nice thick blanket. If they are in any way getting shocky, that's gonna help some to uh, keep as much body heat as you can in, 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 and sort of delay hypovolemic shock. Um, common mistakes that will, again, complicate what I can do or could compromise the final outcome. Giving medications, again, don't give medications before you come in, it many times can limit what I can give. Bandaging, most of the time, unless it's an active bleed, we would prefer you not bandage. And I'll show you some examples later on of why. Um, bandaging is an art. If it's gonna be done, it should be done properly um, to avoid causing more problems than you are trying to avoid. Everyone wants to cover things up. Sometimes that's the worst thing you can do. Everyone wants to take that fractured leg and put something on it. Sometimes that's the worst thing you can do, and we'll go over that a little bit later. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, waiting too long. This is especially on bite wounds. Um, you know, the dogs have a scuffle. There's not much blood, but there's a little scab there. Um, there's always more damage underneath because the tooth goes in through the skin and it swirls around in there and there's muscles and things under there. There's always almost more damage underneath than you want. You don't want to wait on bite wounds. By the time they become an abscess, then you've got a big problem in a very sick dog. Even if you just go in and say it was just a scuffle, we say, ah, oh, that's not too bad. We, sh we clip, we clean, we shave it, send you home on some antibiotics. You may have saved your dog a lot of pain, a lot of illness, and a lot of money later. It's cheaper to just go in, get it done, take care of it, then possibly have the chance of having to come back in later with an abscess. Excuse me. Um, ointments. Ointments are, in general, not a good thing. They uh, collect hair, they collect dirt, and they're really, the, the, the amount of antibiotic in them isn't gonna help in the short term. Um, anytime you have a puncture wound, you don't want ointments because that's going in under the skin and actually causing reactions under the skin instead of being helpful. Scrapes can have a little bit of ointment. It's more for us than it is actually helpful. If you just keep it clean, that's better than putting an ointment on it. Um, and if you put ointment on the wrong thing, again, we have to do more flushing and cleaning and that sort of thing. You can cause reactions with ointments, especially if it gets under the skin. Hydrogen peroxide. Has anyone ever read the hydrogen peroxide bottle? <coughs> on almost every hydrogen peroxide bottle out there, it says, do not use on puncture wounds. People take that bottle and they pour it on every puncture wound, cat bites, those sorts of things. Hydrogen peroxide, um, kills cells. It does not clean much of anything. Scrapes are probably okay. There's better things to use in hydrogen peroxide. <coughs> yes, it kills cells and bacteria are cells, but it's also, if, if there are cells in there that are trying to just heal or haven't quite become damaged enough, that hydrogen peroxide will go in there and just destroy all of them. So hydrogen peroxide is not a good thing to put on wounds. Um, it's not cleansing, it hurts, and it's not supposed to go under the skin. Most puncture wounds have a component of being under the skin. Most lacerations have some under the skin component to them. Some are just through the skin and those are okay. But there's really not a good reason to use hydrogen peroxide on a wound can't think of one good reason to use it on any wound that I've ever seen. Cleans up blood great on the hair, but that's about all it does. 
Um, forcing liquids. If they're vomiting, if they're sick, if they've been injured, everyone worries they won't drink, you won't drink. It's okay. Don't force liquids. If you have a dog that is compromised at all, if they've, if, if say they've, they've had a traumatic accident, they're going into hypovolemic shock, their um, pathway between going into the stomach and going into the lungs could be compromised. You force liquid in there, especially anything but water, and even water is, you can drown to death. Um, it, it, it's not friendly to the cells inside the lungs. So we don't want you to force liquids. Um, if they inhale them, it can be dangerous. If they inhale, inhale too much, it could complicate healing later down the line. If they get a little bit of an aspiration pneumonia or something from it, it could complicate the whole um, illness if, the, if it becomes a long-standing illness. So please don't do that. Um, feeding treats just to see if they'll eat. If they're not eating their dog food, again, this is, this is an important thing about knowing normal. Is your dog normally a great eater? Put the food down, it's inhaled twice a day. I'm going to know when my dogs are not feeling well because I see them eat. I physically see them eat twice a day. So if you know what your dog's normal eating patterns are and they're not wanting to eat their food, they're inappetent. You can maybe try something little, but don't try and just give them treats because, again, that could complicate things. Um, if they're not eating their food, that's enough um, for me to be able to want to see them. If, if they're not eating their food, we probably want to see them. Treats aren't going to help them get better. They help you feel better that they've eaten something, but it's not going to help them get better. Um, ooh, did I go past one? No. Okay. These are the things you do do. You stay calm, phone a friend. If you're coming in, if you have a friend that can come and sit with you, people who are together commiserating and being able to talk, especially if we're waiting a long time, it's a good thing. So stay calm, come in, phone your veterinarian before you come. It's nice for us to know if you're on your way, you're gonna be here 20 minutes, it's a snake bite, we're gonna have everything out and ready for you. And then we can come and get you and deal with it. Um, don't panic your dogs are gonna know you're panicking and they'll pick up on that. Stay calm for them. Don't panic for them. Please don't consult Dr. Google. She's not always right. Um, there are some websites that are very good and I have them listed here. They're coming up pretty quick, I think, that have good information. They all may have a little different information, but that doesn't mean it's not all good. We don't always all agree about things. Um, as doctors, as people, as dog trainers, um, but it doesn't make any of us wrong. But there are some good sites out there that are going to give you good information if you consult any one of these as one of your guides. Um, you'll get good information and not bad information. These are the four trusted internet sites and or animal control that I would recommend. The American uh, Veterinary Medical Association has a um, site. You can, yep, come take a picture. See? Perfect. Come up and take a picture. We can go over this later too. So, yep, come on up. Um, the AVMA, they have a good um, pet owner site. American Animal Hospital Association has a good pet area, pet problems. ASPCA poison control, if you have a poisoning, please call them first. It does cost you money. But they have the best toxicologists on board. They have, especially if it's a human medication, they know exactly. I don't know what human medications are for, you know, those blood pressure pills or whatever. They know, they have seen it all, they've done it all, and if they don't know, they have toxicologists online. It's gonna cost you, I think, 55 bucks, something like that. They follow up, they call me and say, this guy's coming in, this pet, this is what you need to do. We'll call you in two hours and see how you're doing. And if you're having any problems, we'll call our vet. And they call a week later, how did they do? They follow up, they're fantastic. It costs a little bit of money, but if you're concerned at all, or if they've gotten into something you don't know about, call them first. They may say, oh, that's not a dose you need to worry about. Rather pay $55 than the 100 or 150 to come and see me. So, not that I don't want to see you, but um, it's well worth a phone call first on any, any sort of, especially medicine toxicities, but plants, um, agriculture products, anything like that, they're, they're going to have it in their database. 
And if they don't, <laughs> they'll find it. Um, veterinarypartner.com is my favorite, favorite one. There is a, um, a consultation group, it's called Veterinary Information Network, that we can belong to and pay for that has all of these uh, consults, um, internal medicine consultation, surgery, reproduction, toxicology, that we can get online and say, this is what's going on with my patient. Within 20 minutes, one of those uh, consultants is back to me. This is an offshoot of that for pet owners. Veterinarypartner.com, it, it lists just about any of the more common and even some of the less common medical conditions that you may find with your dog and or cat or snake or mouse um, that you might run into. Um, it's all just informational, but if your dog has diabetes or Cushing's disease or pancreatitis or something like that that you're not familiar with, I'll run off one of these sheets all the time and hand it because what I can tell you in five minutes is not what you can read in three or four pages and sometimes that's better. It's a great site, um, it's fantastic, it's updated all the time and it's by trusted consultants and the experts in their fields throughout the country and, some, and sometimes throughout the world. So it's a great site to get information on just about anything. Okay, now some specific things. Bandaging. If you think there's a fracture, please don't bandage it. The reason for that is, Patty, come here, please. And pick on my friends, because they sit up front. Good people should. So, your dog, lean over. There you go. So, if you think you have a broken leg here or here, and, okay, you're broken. Swing, you're broken. If you bandage it and you bandage it the wrong place, the fracture's up here, you put the bandage here, you don't stabilize the shoulder, this fracture is going to swing back and forth like a pendulum. It's going to cut nerves, it's going to cut muscle, it's going to cause way more damage. If we're bandaging a fracture, say the fracture's here, the golden rule of doing a fracture, bandage, splint, something like that, is you have to absolutely stabilize the joint below and the joint above for it to be a good bandage or splint. Um, so if it's broken here, you have to go all the way from here to here. Most people just put something here that rotates, it spins, it causes, well, thank you, it causes way more damage than if you would just put nothing on it at all. The dog is going to put it in the position that it moves the very least. If you put something on there, they're gonna shake it, they're trying to do this. Please don't bandage fractures. Even if you're not sure if it's a fracture, if it's a sprain, they're gonna hold it up. They're not gonna do anything bad to it. Please just leave it alone until we can tell what it is and get a proper bandage on it. Sometimes we can't even bandage them. Sometimes if it's a femoral fracture and it's going to surgery in two days, we can't bandage those. They sit in the cage, but they protect it themselves by holding it up, not laying on it. We can't do that. We, there's no way to do a good bandage there and have it stay and have it do its job. Um, don't use splints for the same reason. What if you put it on the wrong side? What if the fracture goes this way and you put it on here? It's still, it, it's gonna, it, you could do it wrong and make it worse, so don't use splints. Um, don't apply any sort of rigid tape. And I'll show you some, I have a few pictures, I think. Um, one time I had this laceration way, it was really big, right over the neck. I wish I could get my dog up here, but that's okay. Um, the owners were camping. They had duct tape. They duct taped this dog back together <laughs> with this big criss-crossing duct tape bandage right on the hair. I couldn't tell what was going on under there. They didn't want me to sedate the dog. They, so, then they didn't have money, but that's beside the point. We wanna help you, regardless of what's going on. That made everything worse. And then we have to rip that off or cut it off, and then do not, duct tape is not your friend. If it's gonna be 
um, a long time, you know, a day, even before you can get them in. Duct tape doesn't breathe. It can get too tight. It's not flexible. No duct tape. Um, don't use any rigid tapes at all. Vet, rape, vet wrap is fairly safe, but even that used incorrectly can cause problems. Um, don't apply things too tightly. You cause a tourniquet rather than a bandage. Um, what will happen, even if you don't think it's too tight, it looks good as they walk around, the blood flow and the lymph flow doesn't be able to get under the bandage and back up into the body. This foot becomes fat, we need to take it off, and then you have poor circulation going to something we're trying to heal. So unless they're actively bleeding, a bandage is many times less helpful to us and the dog in the short term than bandaging and doing it improperly. Um, you can use flex flexible tape, torn fabric, scarves, nylons, those sorts of things are soft enough and you can't really get them t tight enough to probably cause a problem. Um, so those are the sorts of things that you can use. If you're trying to control bleeding, a simple thing to use is sanitary napkins and tampons. They're designed to absorb blood and fluids. Use those. You can use diapers, you can use um, potty pads, those things that are designed to absorb fluids, those are great things to use if you want to put something under one of these soft bandages to absorb blood or to be able to allow compression. Any of those things, just pile them on, bandage it up, bring them in. Um, use as little as possible. Again, it's easier for us to get off and see something very quickly rather than something that's a multiple layer sort of a thing. I've seen there's a duct tape layer and then there's a vet wrap layer and then there's a white tape layer and then we've got a layer of something else and a layer of something else. It takes me 10 minutes to get through there. I'd like to see it a little more quickly than that. Um, so again, it, a lot of these things are just increasing the efficiency to get your pet seen and treated and taken care of as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, if you do have to do a bandage, you're out in the woods, you're something happens you can't get in for three or four hours because that's what it's going to take you you're up hiking in the mountains be prepared to change that frequently don't put something on for three or four hours and just leave it take it off every hour or so even if it's bleeding unless it's spurting blood then you want to leave something on but you want to allow that limb to rest in case you've put it on too long again if you compromise the blood flow from the beginning it's going to delay healing later on so if you need to put something on, put it on, be prepared to take it off and put it back on. And maybe you need to use more absorbent layers if, if it's bled that much that you need to put something else on it. So be prepared to change it. If you do have to do it, you do, but be prepared to change it. Don't just leave it on for four to five hours as you come in. Try and check it and take it off. Um, <laughs> this is a very nice bloodhound came in with this laceration. This is something like the other one. The people took the flap of skin and put it up and duct taped it all back together. Not this one. I couldn't find the pictures of the other one. They're all gone. I thought I had them somewhere, but I don't. Um, so this is what it looked like um, in the beginning. Um, this was a, he was out in the, out, I, I, he wasn't a search and rescue dog. I think it was probably barbed wire or something like that. Most of these things are, most of the things that are in an L pattern are going to be barbed wire or nails or something like that. Um, Tooth marks don't usually do this. That's usually something they got hung up on and it got ripped back. So this is a little bloodhound that we saw. Oh, can't see the whole thing. I don't know. She's got a laceration right here, right over her forehead. I just thought it was a cool picture. So <laughs> this is a bloodhound when we were done with her. Um, so you can see the laceration. Usually when we repair them, we have to actually sometimes make them bigger to get underneath them and clean them and then put them back together. So what you may see after I'm done, you say, well, but it was only about that big. Well, we had to make it bigger. We had to shave a bigger spot because whatever happened picked up the skin and tore it away from the underneath tissues. We have to get under there, take away all the dead and dying tissue, clean it up properly. We can't do it through a little hole like that. So many times we have to make it bigger. So be prepared. Might be bigger when you pick them up than when they went home. So this is a prime example of what not to do and why not to bandage, especially with Gorilla Tape. So <laughs> around the neck, 
This is not that common. So this dog was in a dog fight. This dog's wound was right here. It wasn't even on the neck. This dog's wound was right here. So the dog went home with a bandage from the veterinarian. The dog got the bandage off somehow, got the bandage off. The owners wanted, wanted to put one back on. So they remembered what it looked like and tried to replicate it. And then they went away and the mom's taking care of the dog. So the mom brings the dog in and she says, well, now I think she's got an abscess or something going on here. See that swelling under the chin? Sort of hard to appreciate, but there's a swelling under the chin here. She says, oh, we must have missed something. There must be an abscess formed. No, this swelling was caused from this being too tight and not being able to drain. So the whole, all I did was cut the bandage off this dog and send her home. <laughs> she's going to be fine. Um, but. It's just one of the things. They thought they were replicating the great bandage for the spot here, and they caused a problem. So just to, you think you're doing the right thing, and you may not be. So just be careful and don't do that. So this is her again. They crisscrossed underneath. You can see how, that, and that's a pretty soft bandage, but if you crisscross underneath, I have actually seen vet wrap and other things that are very stiff cause a laceration under here by being too tight because they move like this. So be cautious. This one did not because that was a nice soft material and it had only been on and grandma brought her in way sooner than dad probably would have, good grandma. Um, so I didn't even bandage this other wound. We just took it off and sent her home. So she did great. So dog bite wounds, again, they're like icebergs. There's almost always more damage underneath that little puncture wound than there is on top. I have seen lacerations of muscles and nerves and things from one tiny little hole. So it's always best to get them seen. Um, with dog, especially big dog, little dog things, they pick up the skin, they shake a little bit, and they tear all of those attachments. And you've got this big dead space that needs to be <coughs> cleaned and flushed out. Um, use direct pressure. That's a good thing. It's better than a bandage. Two people, one person's holding pressure on it, the other person's driving. Person who's holding pressure can be on the phone, driver can be on the phone, whatever. But direct pressure with something allows you to take a look at it, allows you to change it, and it's a little more, most of the times, comforting for the dog than trying to hold him down and put a bandage on and get there. If you just hold it, get in the car, and drive, um, direct pressure works great. If you're going to use something big like on that bloodhound, if it's a big surface area, you can use um, towels, again, sanitary napkins, diapers, anything like that, soaked with saline. Contact saline solution is just fine. If you don't have saline solution, just water is fine. It's important to keep wounds nice and moist. They heal better. I need to cut less tissue away to get fresh tissue by the time we get to fixing them than if they had not been kept moist. Not ointments, saline, water's okay, better than nothing. Um, if you have to do something like that and you have to, and, and you might have to tape it on, put a t-shirt on over the bandage, tape over the t-shirt. So if you're in a position like that bloodhound, they could have put a big wad of, of towels on there, soaked it into the water saline, put a shirt over and put one wrap of duct tape. Don't tell anyone I told you to use duct tape, but something that's gonna hold that in place to keep that moist. So in, in that situation you can, but put a t-shirt on over it so it's not directly on the hair. Um, don't allow them to lick, bite or rub, whatever the area is. If you have an e-collar, use it. If not, hold their head. About 10 licks from a dog. You guys, every, well, most everyone has been licked by a dog somewhere. Their tongue is rough. They can cause more damage in 10 licks than you can imagine. So keep them away from it. Rubbing against the carpet, especially those eye injuries. They can cause more eye injuries. They can cause more ulcers. Um, and again, bandage with caution. Bleeding, use direct pressure, sanitary napkins. Don't use tape. 
uh, use the flexible tape with caution. Flexible tape, I'm talking about vet wrap, but it, vet wrap, coflex, any of those sorts of things. Um, it's very easy to get it too tight. It's pretty stretchy, and you start stretching that and put it on, and you can actually cause more of a tourniquet um, effect rather than a bandaging effect, especially if you just go around where the wound is. Um, use a tourniquet only if it's a last resort. A tourniquet is some sort of rigid material that will go around the uh, whole circumference of a leg. And then the best thing to do is to put a stick or something in there and twist that. So make a, make a circle, put it in, and twist it. Can everyone understand what I mean by that? Um, I had one come in the other day, just a couple of days ago. I don't know if I have pictures of her. She was really bleeding. I mean, she, it, she had lacerated this vein here. She, it wasn't an artery, but she was really bleeding. And the owner had taken rope and just tied a couple of knots in the rope and thought that was great. And he helped, but if he would have taken a stick in there and just twisted it, it would have been much better. She wouldn't have lost as much blood. She did great. Um, but that's the way to put a tourniquet on. Make a, make a circle, something rigid, put a stick in and twist it. Then, if you're four hours out, every 20 minutes or so you can undo it. Allow a little bit of circulation to those parts that are not broken or damaged, and then put the tourniquet back on so that they uh, don't lose any more blood. Foreign bodies, we're talking about things that penetrate the skin. Things like stickers, sticks, posts, wires, things like that. Don't try and remove it. Again, you can cause more damage if re you remove them and they're somewhere where they are, it's a delicate area, than if you would just leave it alone. If you have to remove it to get them off of something, great. But if you can bring them in with whatever it is, fish hooks, whatever, um, leave them there, we'll try and remove them. Don't let your pet put a leash on, get them tight, get them short. Um, don't let them move around too much. Don't let them jump in and out of the car. Any sort of movement like that can drive those things into areas that we, we either can't reach to get them out or are more difficult to get out. Um, don't allow them to pet, chew, rub, or lick again. Um, and don't wait until the morning. Um, some people will do that. Please don't do that. Any penetrating foreign body is a reason enough to be seen because they can cause more damage under the skin. And even sometimes when we have those dogs run into sticks, you think it's out and there's a piece of stick still in there. So anything that's penetrating, we probably need to see sooner rather than later. Porcupines. We see a lot of porcupine quills. I just want to clear up some fallacies about porcupine quills. Um, porcupine quills are barbed like fish hooks. They only go in, they don't come out. Um, by trying to remove them by yourself, again, it's very much like those dog bites that grab the skin the skin comes up and damage happens underneath. What happens many times when people try and remove them at home is they're pulling, the skin tends up, that thing breaks and it shoots right under the skin. We can't get those, we can't get all of them. Those are stuck under the skin. Um, we can't do surgery to go in, we'd have to lay the whole dog open to try and get those or any of those. So you can cause more problems by trying to pull them out. Lauren, you're a troublemaker. Yes, what can I do? Right, and that happens more often when you try and get them out than if you don't. If they pull out easily, some of them, some, there are two types of porcupine dogs. Those ones that go up and poke them and say, oh, that hurts, those are barely stuck, those come out pretty easily. The ones that are here are usually, it's the ones around the muzzle and in the mouth, and then the ones that want to kill the porcupine. And then they go back the next day, and the next day. Literally, I had two, two, um, St. Bernard's and a bulldog come in three days in a row. Three days in a row, full, covered. The bulldog led the charge. <laughs> he was the worst, and then the, other, the, 
Bernard's were just back. It was three days in a row. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was funny. So um, you don't want to try and pull them at home because we end up with more. There are exceptions, but there's more of a problem with them breaking off and going under the skin. Also, you're causing trauma. It's easier to just sedate them. They are extremely painful. If you've ever gotten one stuck in yourself and tried to pull it out, it is extremely painful. Let's sedate them. Let's do anesthesia if we have to. Um, don't cut the quills. That doesn't do anything, but um, it, it's a fallacy. Some people say, cut it, let the air out. No, they, they have barbs. They're not air injected. Um, and that gives us less of a handle to get them out if we need to get them out later. Um, don't let them paw or rub around. They force them deeper in. I've had several people say, oh yeah, he's been doing this the whole time. I'm like, please don't let him do that. I know it's hard not to, but it makes things worse. <coughs> um, snake envenomation. Um, don't delay, don't cut over the bite, don't suck on the bite. Most dogs won't let you do that. Uh, don't place a tourniquet, uh, don't use ice, don't give any medication. The best treatment is antivenin. The best thing you can do is get in and let your veterinarian um, give antivenin. Is anyone in a high rattlesnake population at all? Okay. Copperheads. What's that? Yeah, Copperheads. Well, there, I was just going to mention that there is one type of um, antivenin out there right now that is a frozen horse plasma antivenin that is good for five years in your fridge. A freezer, sorry. Most of the antivenins are in a powder form and you reconstitute them. They're only good once you reconstitute them and they're done. And their expiration date, even in the powder form, is a year, maybe a year and a half. And each one costs our veterinary clinic anywhere from $500 to $1,000. It's very expensive. So to stock that and have it go out of date, it is not good for us. So if we don't use it, if we use it, it's great. Um, but there's a new product out there that I've been using for about a year that seems to work pretty well, um, as well as any of the other ones do, and it's frozen plasma. Those of you that might be hunters or live in high snake areas and your veterinarian or a veterinarian where you might be traveling may not have it, value of rattlesnakes. snakes. You can, you can ask your veterinarian, if you have a good veterinarian, can I buy some of that from you and have it in my fridge for five years? Because if I'm traveling and the veterinarian there, not everyone, not everyone can stock it. Pretty much only the emergency veterinarians in Montana can even stock it because it's too expensive for smaller clinics to keep on hand. Very expensive. You can carry your own. There's nothing that says you can't have it. You can't administer it, but you can take it in and say, you don't have antivenin. Here it is. Please give this to my dog. So there's a new kind out there, and it's actually less expensive than the other kinds. So that's something, if you live in a high rattlesnake area, you might. Um, yes? How much is it? Um, I would have to look. Okay. Probably 600, okay. four to 600, I would think. There's going to be a markup. Sure. Don't know how much. But it costs us still quite a bit. But still, it's better than not having it if you need it. Absolutely. And it's good for six years. And your five or six years, I think, is the expiration date. It's ridiculous. We've never been able to have that before. And we can stock that more because we can keep it. We can keep it for five or six years. It's not going to outdate on this. So OK, it's 6 o'clock. I knew I was going to have way more information than we could go over. And we're in a class downstairs soon, I believe. Is Gail in here? Vicky's here. So I think we probably need to stop here. Oh, I've got like eight or nine slides more. If they're not, if they're not ready to go with the brood bitch class presentation, it's not a class. It's a pre. Yeah. So we're, we probably need to go then. You absolutely, I would, I would enjoy that. And also, I'm here all day tomorrow. I'll be mostly helping out stewarding um, in the obedience area. So you can find me. I'm loud. Not, uh, I dress loud. Um, I'm usually easy to find and fairly easy to talk to. So you're welcome. OK. Of course.
course. Yeah, you need to follow me around, though, because I'm going to be packing up and getting ready to go. <laughs>